Subscribe to futuremoneytrends.com today to receive our weekly wealth digests, expert interviews, and to read monthly investment and income producing ideas. Futuremoneytrends.com, smart money invested in future trends. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I'm here with Steve St. Angelo of srsroccoreport.com. Steve, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, hey, Dan. Nice to, nice to be here speaking with you. Steve, you have a lot of information about the precious metals and, and really the oil and energy markets that no one is talking about. So I want to start off right away with basically um, the silver market. Um, and for people who have heard silver interviews, please listen to this man because you're going to hear things about the fundamentals about the silver market that you have not thought of. Um, let's talk about the silver market and just kind of give people an assessment of why you think silver will go up. Um, and I, I noticed that you don't really mention the inflation or the the macroeconomics in, in a kind of a doom and gloom kind of a way. You're, you're, all of your points are really geared towards the energy market. So if you could please introduce our audience to why you think silver is a good investment. Okay, well, I, let's just, uh, I wrote an article in, uh, about silver investment demand. And if we look at global silver investment in 2007, it was $5 billion, uh, $500 million. In 2008, it was $1.1 billion. 2009, $2.9 billion. And then in 2011, global silver investment demand, coins, metal, bullion, reached a high of $8.8 .8 billion. That's the whole world, everybody. In 2012, it actually declined to about $7.9 billion. And I'd imagine right now it's, it's a lot less than that. Now, the thing is, what we find interesting, the, the Fed is actually propping up the market not only the U.S. market, the global economy, the global markets, because the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency. And as everyone knows, the Fed is buying $45 trillion a month of U.S. treasuries and $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities. I mean, that's $85 billion a month just in those two assets. And this is not including what we don't know about. Uh, that's being propped up either through different uh, currency exchanges, swaps, and et cetera. So when we think that in 2011, the most the silver market has ever purchased, invested, was $8.8 .8 I mean, that, that is a fraction of a fraction mm -hmm. of what is being thrown around. So um, to get back to, to why I think silver is such a good investment, uh, it gets back to energy. Uh, and then energy... It controls everything. When a person's sick, the first thing they say, you know, I'm so sick, I don't have the energy to get out of bed. So you need energy to work. You need energy to make the economies move and grow. Uh, and this is my saying, energy is the driver of the economy, and money, gold, and silver are supposed to be the batteries. They store this uh, energy value, this economic energy that we trade. Because when you think about it, Everything that we do is basically trading energy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like the energy matrix. Uh, if you ever seen the movie The Matrix, they're looking at a screen. All they see is the code. Yeah. And, and remember, he says, "Well, if you look at the, if you look at the screen long enough, you don't you don't see the code anymore." Well, you know, if you buy a sneaker, the overwhelming value of a sneaker, a pair of sneakers, a pair of shoes, is the energy that went into it in all steps, in all forms, and in all stages. So even though it's not a barrel of oil or natural gas or coal, whatever, it's actually energy that's locked into that shoe. Uh, and so when you think about it, basically all we're doing is trading energy. So in the future, we're starting to see uh, we're in a, the world has been a plateau of energy production since about 2005. And we're producing around 75, 76 million barrels of oil a day. And we haven't, we haven't increased that now, except a little bit this last year in 2012. So we, if you can't increase your oil production, global oil production, you can't increase your GDP. And the problem is, and I'm getting a little long-winded here, all these huge assets that are out there. And... According to uh, the U.K. City Report, 
$85.2 trillion worth of conventional assets as of 2012 are basically paper assets that are pension plans, mutual funds, insurance funds that aren't really assets. You've got to burn energy in the future so that these assets can be paid off. So what it is is a huge Ponzi scheme. So the world has basically put all their resources and their money into a Ponzi scheme that in the future cannot be paid off. Let me ask you just real quick going back to the oil production uh, plateauing because I am seeing reports from the government, which is not a trusted source, but that is what the market will base uh, a lot of the buying and selling of energy, that the United States has dramatically increased its energy production of barrels per day, and that even by 2030, the United States may not even be importing oil and may be a net exporter. What, what is your analysis of those type of reports that have come out from the government? Okay, no, that's an excellent question. Uh, it is true. In 2000, around 2008, the U.S. was producing conventional. I'm not talking about uh, see, conventional oil and uh, condensate. That's the typical oil we're talking about. That's a high-cost, high-quality oil. There are natural gas plant liquids. There's refining gains. Now, if people are not familiar with the energy or the oil industry, when you put in a barrel of oil, 42 gallons, you get out more than you put in through the fracking process. Uh, the cracking process. So you, you get what is called a refinery gain. Before, because we import so much oil, we show so much a refinery gain. And so that looks like we're, you know, we, there's more oil than we, what we're really making. And then there's also the bio, um, biofuels, which are really not cost effective. But let's just take for an example. Here's what's really interesting. Uh, Dan, in, in 2008, the U.S., before shale came on the picture, was producing about 5 million barrels of oil a day. Now, the, the rate of decline year, every year was 5%. So that means in 2009, the United States had to find about 250,000 new barrels of oil to replace the offset of the decline, the annual decline rate. Well, we are almost up to 7.5 million barrels of oil this year, and that is, of course, due to shale. So if you look at it at face value, you go, wow, look at that, it's 2.5 million barrels more a day. The problem is with shale, it averages 40 to 50% decline rate per year. So when you factor in now that we're at 7.5 million barrels, we're now over a 10% decline rate, and, you, and that's, that's conservative. Mm -hmm. So now we need to find, next year, we have to find 750,000 barrels a day just to remain flat compared to 250,000 barrels a day back in 2008. So this is a problem that no one sees, and so th that's the reason why the, um, the world has been in a plateau. Because each year, the, the global oil production decline rate is about 5% as well. So each year, they have to find between 4 and 5 million barrels. And we have been doing that. The problem is shale oil that's come onto the uh, market, you know, and it, it declined, its decline rate is so high that you need to find so much more of it just to stay ahead. It's basically you're running faster just to stay ahead. And, and now that we're on this, let me just give you some quick uh, information here. In 2009, the back end oil field added 441 new net wells. And they added 63,000 barrels a day of new production. By 2010, they added 107,000 barrels a day of new production, but they had to have 702 two new wells that year. In 2011, they almost brought on 200,000 barrels of oil a day of new production. But they had to use 1,159 new wells. And now these aren't just new wells. These are net new wells. People think that they're not drying any dry wells in the back. And they are. And some of them are not performing well, so they're shutting them in. Hmm. Here's what's interesting. 
So in 2009, the average well was producing 144 uh, barrels of oil a day. In 2010, it was 152. 2011, it was 170. Now, here's the clincher. In 2012, the bank added 1,657 new wells, 500 more than 2010, but they put on 222,000 barrels. Unfortunately, that was only 134 barrels of oil per, per well. It's mm. fallen from that 170. Now, in just the first five months of 2013, they, uh, the oil producers in the back of the region have, produ- have uh, added 70,000 more new barrels of oil a day. But that's with 564 new wells, net new wells, and that means we're now down to 125 barrels of oil per well. So it, it kind of peaked in 2011 and has been falling down. And so now, for them to keep this, for them to keep this whole thing going, they have to add even more wells each year, and that becomes more expensive. So this is the problem with shale, uh, oil, and shale gas. Now, how how about the demand for energy? Have we seen because of the headwinds in the economy, the global economy? Have we seen kind of a a Tamper, de- taper down demand for, for actual energy use, or is it still rising? This is the problem. Um, the problem is, if you've got 50, if you've got, uh, if you have 75 million barrels of oil a day, the demand can't be any more than that, can it? Mm-hmm. There is some spare capacity. There, they, they call it spare capacity in Saudi Arabia and different countries. The problem is um, no one is quite sure, because it's all state industry uh, kept secrets, no one is quite sure how much that spare capacity is. But the thing is, uh, the problem is you can't demand more than you produce. And you brought up a, a great point, and I want to get into that, if you don't mind. Sure. Um there's two. There's two. There's actually three things with the energy market we need to understand. There's uh, production. There is the EROI, which is the energy return on invested. Now that's a whole different field. Then the third thing, which I want to talk about right now, is available net exports. So let me give you a quick example. Indonesia used to be a part of OPEC, and in 1980 they were producing 1.6 million barrels of oil a day. They were exporting almost 1.2 million, and they were consuming for their own economy about 400,000 barrels. Well, this is interesting. In 2011, they have to import about 500,000 barrels of oil a day. Their production has fallen from 1.6 million only to about 900,000 barrels, but their their consumption is now 1.5 million barrels a day. So Indonesia, who used to be a part of, ex- of OPEC when they were a exporting nation, because their demand, their internal domestic demand is so high, they have to import oil to, to meet this demand. Now, this is happening in every country around the world. And many people don't realize Saudi Arabia has been Right up there with uh, Russia, number one, number two, they're producing about 10, 10.2 million barrels of oil a day. But hardly anybody realizes Saudi Arabia is the fifth largest consumer of oil on the planet. I mean, that, that's big when you figure China and, and the United States are, are, are consuming quite a bit. And here's an interesting statistic. In, uh, 19, uh, in 1980... Saudi Arabia was consuming 600,000 barrels of oil. Today, they're consuming 3 million. Wow. So the Middle East was consuming a little more than 2 million barrels of oil in 1980. Now they're consuming about 8.5 million. When you refer to, like, peak oil, is it peak cheap oil? Or is there are we really running out of oil? Well, the thing is, we'll never run out of oil. There's always going to be some black crude oil around somewhere. Uh, the peak is, and this is what's important, this is besides what I'm getting into about the net exports. Um, peak, peak oil is when you can no longer bring on new oil that 
will offset the decline of the existing oil fields. And that's where we're at right now. And uh, that's where the world is. They're still adding oil, but the problem is they can't add oil fast enough to actually make it grow higher than, than just a plateau. So when you say peak oil, you get to a point where you just, uh, the decline rates and new oil coming on, you just start falling off. And the U.S. actually peaked in about 1970, 71 at 10 million barrels of oil. So even though we're back at 7.5, I believe the shale oil bonanza is going to be something that's short-lived. Uh, it's not something that's sustainable. Because let me tell you this, um, according to Rune Lickburn of Fractional Flow, he estimates the cumulative uh, net cash flow of the shale oil producers is a negative $14 billion since 2000. Nine to August 2012. They're dumping so much money in the capital into producing this oil, their they're, they're net cash flow is negative. So they have to go out to Wall Street and get financing to keep this whole shale energy system going. It's not something back in the good old days where you, you, know, you poked, poked a hole in the ground in the 1930s and oil just shot out. And now that, here's the thing, is the energy return on invested 1930 oil was 100 to 1. That means the cost of one barrel, the U.S. was producing 100. Shale oil in the back end is about 5 to 1. Hmm. That's, that's, so it's 20 times less what, what, what Oklahoma was putting out in 1930. So this is... This is indeed the problem, and uh, let me get let me go to one more thing about the oil, which is really important. This is this is what's important to know. And why is the price of oil one hundred eleven hundred twelve dollars a barrel today? Two thousand eleven was the same compared to let's say two thousand four when it was thirty eight. Well, the reason why is what is known as available net exports. If you take the top 33 net oil exporters and they, you take away their consumption, plus China and India, it peaked at 40.6 million barrels in 2005. It's now down to 34.4. So in just, I guess it's six, seven years, the available net exports, everybody else, it's 155 importing countries. There is six million barrels of oil less than there was in 2005. So, with the higher competition, the price of oil has tripled in price. That is incredible data, right there. Um, just looking at trying to forecast where the economy is going, um, and the, the what the economy is bumping its head on is is the lack of a, the ability to uh, can you continue to produce oil and increase the oil the way we used to. Um, I want to move into uh, silver, Steve. Um, you, you've written an article, I, I want to say this article is probably a year and a half ago, about peak silver. And a lot of people, they hear that and they're kind of like scratching their heads, like, what are you talking about? Um, if you could just talk about the, um, on why you think we have actually peaked in production, if you have any examples of, of states or countries, uh, you, you can share with the, with our members as well as um, the the discovery, the return. You were just talking about the return on investment for oil. If you have anything uh, as an example of return on investment for silver as well. Well, you know, uh, the margins the margins for producing silver were much better, like in the eighteen hundreds. Uh, the, the, do you know the average grade uh, back in Australia in the eighteen eighties was two thousand grams per ton. That, that, that was like 60, 65 ounces a ton. And, uh, and it's been slowly falling ever since. And uh, in, a, in a recent article, I show that uh, the top six miners, and this is Fresnillo, BHP, Cannington, uh, BHP Cannington's mine, Pan America, Polymetal, Hochschild, and Hecla, the top six silver companies and their primary mines, they were producing silver 
at about 13 ounces per ton in 2005. In 2012, they're down to 8.1. So that's a 38% decline in their average yield. Now, this is different than their uh, grade. The yield is once they process the metal, so it's a little bit lower. But so what, you, what you're seeing is, is that um, it's taking more. You have to move more ore and process more ore to produce the same metal. Now, we, we haven't peaked in silver production yet. Uh, I think it was in 2012, according to the U.S. Uh, the World Silver Survey, I think the world produced 787 million ounces of silver, and that was up from 757 in 2011. So it's still growing because we're bringing on new mines. And uh, But what's going to happen, there's kind of a lag effect, but... I believe we'll probably see peak silver before the end of the decade. And depending on what happens with the world economic system, that might happen even sooner. Uh, it's hard to kind of forecast that, but I think we, we could see peak silver within the next couple of years. And I think I mentioned this before we start the interview, that uh, for some reason I'm trying to find out Mexico's silver production is down is down 10% in April. And that, that, that's a big thing. Where's Mexico rank uh, as far as silver producer countries for people who are, are hearing you talk about Mexico? What what is it in the top five? Yeah, actually Mexico is like Saudi Arabia. They're, they're the number one silver producer in the world. And I'm trying to get that, that figure. Uh, they... Mexico produced 160 million ounces of silver uh, in, in uh, 2012, and that compares to the U.S. that produced uh, 32 million. And uh, I think Peru was second. Peru produced 111 million ounces. So it, it just goes to show you that Mexico is, is, the, is the largest silver producer, and uh, tying this back to oil, Mexico is also suffering the same problem with their oil uh, situation. Um, I figure, or uh, Jeffrey Brown is the one who's responsible for this this um, land export model, and that basically figures out how much oil a, com- a country can um, export from its rising, its, its declining production and its rising consumption. I believe Mexico will probably have to import oil by 2020. Um, and that may even be, uh, that, that may even turn out to be 2018. They're still exporting oil today, but they're exporting a lot less than they were 10 years ago. So the world is banking on Mexico being, you know, a leader in silver production, um, but they're going to have to be able to run their mines, and they're going to have to need imported oil. So how is that going to impact price? So these are the things that, a lot of analysts are not looking at. Um, maybe they're not uh, a problem today, but they're becoming a worse problem, as we all know that the cost of production has almost tripled since uh, 2002 for producing an ounce of silver. Uh, so I don't know if I answered your question. But, you uh, did. I mean, it shows that even the silver miners, are. it doesn't seem like they might be calculating this number of their future costs for energy. Um, can I ask you how how has this recent pullback affected the miners? Are they able to pull a profit? The uh, guys who are who are basically just producing silver. Well, I've been looking at the the uh, the top twelve miners, and uh, the um, the problem is you've got a huge range between the, uh, the, the the miners, and let's go in quarter one. In quarter one, and I'm going by a net income break even. Of course, they have cash costs and then production costs, and then there's the net income. Cash costs are their bare minimum, and I don't believe mines can survive at that. Look at what just happened with uh, U.S. Silver and Alexco Resources. U.S. Silver is going to, uh, they, they're going to cut a third of their, of their workforce. And uh, Alexco which is producing silver at like 20 ounces per ton up in Canada. It's their, it's their only primary silver mine. I mean, that, that's a lot of silver per ton. 
mm-hmm. they're going to uh, actually put their mind on care and maintenance uh, in the winter, hopefully hoping that prices are going to recover in 2014. Now, when I'm looking at Alexco, their, their actual break-even, net income break-even, is $35 an ounce. Wow. Uh, and the reason for that is because they have to sell 25% of their silver to uh, Silver Wheaton at $4 an ounce. And uh, U.S. silver comes in at $36. So I've heard analysts say, that these miners can keep running because their cash costs are low. Well, both of these miners' cash costs are $16. Well, right now, in the second quarter of 2013, the average price of silver was $25. It's currently, you know, at 20 But how can how, how come these miners are already shutting down and cutting back when their cash costs are $16? So the problem is cash costs, I believe, are not real indicative. They're not a real measure of the profitability of the company. So First Majestic can keep going. They're one of the top producers because actually their net income break even is at $18. Hmm. And they're much lower. I mean, they're like $10, $12 lower than the higher margin ones. So First Majestic can survive much longer because of their, their profitability. Now, let's say all these primary silver guys, uh, silver companies, either went out of business or, or put, their, put their production on hold. How much silver comes from the non-primary silver producers? Just for instance, uh, according to my, my spreadsheet here, in 2000, uh, in, the, in the third quarter of 2012, the, uh, the top 12 primary silver miners they produced 21 million ounces of silver, just those companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other companies out there. Uh, right now, the, the typical primary miners are about 29, 30% of silver production. So they're, in 2012, they're, I think they produced right around 221 million ounces. So the thing is, you know, Pan America, they actually produced the most silver that quarter. It was about $6.2 million. Well, their net income break-even is almost 27 <laughs> So right now, they're, they're losing about $7 net income. Uh, again, their cash costs are lower than that, but they're, they're losing probably $7 net income. Now, whatever I don't know what, had, what they've done to cut back on exploration, on other costs. They may have lowered that. But uh, Pan American uh, Core, their net income break even is 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 twenty six dollars as well. So they're kind of in the same predicament as Pan American. They uh, they have high costs, and they produce between both of them. They produced about uh, ten million ounces of silver in just one quarter. So they're they're in the medium stage that could be affected here. They 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 will have to start shutting down mines at a higher cost mines. But, um, uh, you see, I find this this is a shame because, really, the silver and gold miners are actually producing wealth. Mm-hmm. They're producing this gold and silver that's in a coin value that you can trade for other items. And because of what's happening with, with Fed policies and central bank policies, of, of this huge amount of monetary printing and uh, propping up. I mean, the U.S. Treasury market is being propped up, as you know, because there, it's artificial, it's artificial um, demand. So it's a shame that these silver producers have to be affected because of uh, how I see it manipulated silver and gold prices. So if the price of silver remains this low, I don't think it is, but if it, if it remains... Between eighteen and twenty dollars for the next two quarters, you're going to see more mines being shut down, put on care and maintenance, and it, it is a shame too because uh, they're actually producing wealth where the banks today are actually stealing it. it it's it's really a, it's quite the difference that, that it used to be. I have mixed feelings. I wouldn't mind seeing a little more blood on the streets um, in order to purchase more silver at lower prices or purchase mining stocks that are 
pretty desperate. Uh, Steve, we're going to have to cut it off here, but I want to know if you can come back in, like, let's say, a week to two weeks and do a sure. follow-up, because this was a good introduction uh, to your website for our, for our members, and I'm certain we'll have a lot of questions and a lot of feedback, so we'll definitely want to expand on this and really go more into the current price as well, because we kind of laid a good foundation here. But uh, Steve St. Angelo, SRSRoccoReport.com. Uh, you can find him there, find his articles, and uh, look forward to uh, speaking with you soon. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Dan.